Hey, people of the universe, you're listening to Nervous Rex. That's a new intro song. I mean, you're just always off the cuff. I am very talented. That's uh, true. Thank you for being here with me, Dillard. You're welcome. We had a very good talk with Ryan Leone, or is it Ryan Leone? I think it's Leone. Okay. But why? I don't I can't know. Remember. He corrected us. He's a good man, and he has some great stories. And great stories. Dude, yeah. He kind of... Um, lived a life that most people, including myself, would never understand. I had to, I already knew who he was and he reached out to me to do the podcast and I already had seen him before because I watch a lot of these prison uh, YouTube shows and I had seen him before and I was like, oh, this dude's rad and he's done, he's got a movie in the works and a book. He's a smart dude, well read. He obviously read a lot. Um, I don't know if it was just in prison. He had a, he's an artist. I mean, the dude's pretty he's fucking talented. Spoken. So anyway, we got to talking with him, mm -hmm. and he's a, man, he's got some stories. He has some stories. He has some crazy energy. Yeah, he had crazy energy, but That's so That's an L.A. I. thing to say. Well, he's from, it's okay, he's from Santa Barbara. Now he lives in the Inland Empire, and, you know, he's friends with Johnny Depp. He's friends with, because a lot of people oh, yeah. like me in Hollywood, they want to be around the real, since we're around so many bullshit fake gangsters and fake, mm -hmm. it's cool to be around something real. Yeah. So I think I gravitate towards anything real because I'm in a land of bullshit. Does that make sense? That does make sense. You're always searching yeah. to learn. Yeah, well, I, I have beginner's brain, which I think is a good thing. I just want to learn, and I realize the older I get, the less I know. I don't know shit, and I just want to learn. And this dude had some stories. He had stories. They were eye-opening. It scared me. They're like, I will opening. never I will never do math. Yeah, well, <laughs> have you ever done Adderall? No. Okay, same thing, because it just makes you tweaky and weird, and it's a, it's, yeah, man, those, look, I'm naturally on uppers by just my energy, so yes. for me, those don't work for me. I always like taking things that made me down. Weed. Weed. Yeah, a Xanax once in a while, but I can't do any of those anymore, unless I'm flying to Europe or somewhere far, I'll take Xanax, but the, I... I just get drunk. Oh, I call yeah. Weekend at Bernie's drunk. Like, I don't want to remember getting on the plane. Weekend at Burning Man. Yeah. Would you ever go to Burning Man? <laughs> no. Okay, right. I don't, I mean, like, after seeing... Look, there's a lot of hot girls there. I'm very into that. I'm into the aesthetics. Mm. But, like, that's my nightmare. I don't want to barter It's for not my barter. Meal. I keep telling you, it's a gifting oh. economy. We don't need to go down that road. I <laughs> feel that everyone should go once, even if they go for a couple of days and have an experience, because that place will blow your mind. But I get it. It's not for everybody. And specifically, I don't picture a lot of North Carolinians there. It's North it's Carolinian. North Carolinians. It's a weirdo West Coast thing. and a, But the whole world goes there. I know. I mean, like, I'm down with hanging out with people that aren't like me, but it's just, it seems very dusty. It's very dusty. Like, but you gotta, do you inhale part, that? That can't be good for you. you. You Look, you're inhaling this shit all day out here in L.A., so it's pollutants <laughs> everywhere. I, I find the dust to be part of the experience, which is, like, just fucking, like... When you first get there, they say, is this your first time here? And if you, when you say yes, they make you roll around in the dust to embrace the grime because you're just going to get dusty anyway. So you got to just get it over with and roll around in the dirt. This is very It'd be good sterile. for you. Someone needs to roll you around in the mud. No, I don't like dirty or smelly things. Yeah, and that's I why you're I feel cleanie. like... You're a cleanie. I, know, I feel like Burning Man would really... I mean, I'm just getting comfortable with Venice. Yeah, yeah it is... <laughs> I, yeah, it's I mean, LA's having a weird, weird, the dirty homeless, ep epidemic. Yeah. I mean, I saw a man with his pants down on the sidewalk having a little incontinent. It wasn't great. Uh, it's really bad right now. I saw a dude, in, I was on the beach the other day, and this dude just rolls up, takes his pants down, <laughs> takes a shit right in the water, and just starts splashing the water on his butthole in front of these European families. And I remember looking at them and just thinking, oh, great, now they're going to go back to Sweden or wherever they're from <laughs> and say, you won't believe what we saw in Santa Monica. Like, that place is fucked. It's really bad. I don't know what the answer is. Neither I do I. I wish I could help, but what can you do? Now, just continue to open your eyes to your new experiences. Yeah, I guess there's, I forget who says it. I wrote, I've been writing down a lot of quotes lately, and one of them was written by, oh, fuck, I'm going to forget his name and the quote, but it's something like, you know, if you want to fix the problems of the world, start with yourself. But in this situation, how do I start fixing myself with the homeless epidemic? What do I do? Just help my neighborhood? How do I help? I huh. mean, you're asking the wrong person. I, yeah. I get too uncomfortable, like, volunteering. It's right. psychological. Would, it's uh, just it's yeah. so far gone but i that is true you can't help other people unless you help yourself first yeah exactly you have have, to be yeah. your best self have you ever had sex with a black asian or hispanic man no okay so you're racist Good no i'm not look i'm not racist right. just wondering. Uh, <laughs> i feel it's the opportunities never even been presented no. i didn't even know a jewish person well 
Well, I don't Jewish. think I you knew a Jewish person. You might have. You just don't know. I know. Well, we they blend don't in. announce. Did you, uh, Chelsea Handler, I just watched her White Privilege special, and she had a black boyfriend in high school that she went to visit, and it was really cool to see her with her old black boyfriend. It was very cultural eye-opener. Well, she dated a, yeah. she dated Fit Fofty. Oh, that's 50, right. That's 50. no surprise. I forgot she dated Fofty. Yeah, she, yeah. she was always been very open. She's from Pennsylvania. Oh, know. she's from New Jersey. New Jersey. Anyway, that being said, for whatever reason, at the worst segue I could have done. But nonetheless, <laughs> let's jump in right into this amazing episode with Ryan Leone. 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 Fuck. I'm going I'm sorry, Leone, Ryan. Italian. If you're listening, I'm sorry, dude. We we love you. I just forget a lot of things. Enjoy this episode, guys. Happy <laughs> We're here at Nervous Rex with Ryan Leone, who is kind enough to come down and tell his story, which I'm really excited about Dillard. That's Dillard, by the way, if you guys haven't met. Uh, you guys I, get, acquainted, <laughs> get acquainted. She is going to be chiming in here and there, and she's a lovely Southern woman, and you're a Santa Barbara man. I am. Okay, let's get into it. You wrote a book called Wasting Talent, which is an autobiography. Novel. Novel? But loosely uh, autobiographical. About what? 80% true. Okay, okay. So you had a crazy life, dude. Let's just kind of get right into it. You, uh, you did some time. You, you worked with a heroin uh, smuggle operation for a little bit. This is fascinating to me. I want to hear all about it. So let's just jump into it. Let's, okay, let's, let's get, get into it. it. Yeah. Um, so my name's Ryan Leone. I'm 34. Um, I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. I moved to Santa Barbara, California when I was three. My, I'm an only child, and my dad owned a national healthcare company. Um, I had a pretty normal childhood. I didn't get molested or anything. And I had debilitating ADD, you know? And I think as a result, it made me insecure for most of my lifetime. And when I was in sixth grade, because of my ADD and because of my debilitating learning disabilities, I got held back a grade. And that was really hard. Like all my friends were going to public junior high. They're going to finger bang girls and I'm going on fucking field trips with sixth graders. And that left like a really indelible blemish on my insecurities. It made me insecure. And so when I get into high school, I get into drugs and I got expelled from three high schools within the span of a month because I'm doing drugs. I'm smoking weed, doing the more PG-13 drugs in the beginning. And so I spent um, a disproportionate amount of my teenage years in institutions for troubled adolescents. And then I got some writing published when I was in high school, poetry, short story. My first short story when I was nine, I ended up going out to Worcester, Massachusetts for an internship program. And I started learning screenplay writing out there, but I got into IV heroin out there. I was smoking black tar in Santa Barbara when I was in high school. So I went to my first rehab for heroin when I was 17, but I'd never injected it. So I got into IV heroin out there and, um, you know, my life imploded pretty quickly after that. And I started going to rehabs and jails, probably been to 25 rehabs. My parents were very supportive. My college education or whatever money that they had saved for my college education pretty much went to rehab. And I was in and out of jail for pretty petty stuff in the beginning. You know, I do three months here, four months there, nonviolent drug stuff. And when I was in my early 20s, I started brokering media for Spike TV. I was buying clips like wildest moments caught on tape, like police chases, fights, and I would sell those. This was before the advent of YouTube. So that stuff was still um, saleable back then. And around that time, I started making real money. But my drug habit was gargantuan. So I started selling drugs. First, it was club drugs. I was, in, I was selling Molly, like kilos of Molly. So I was selling stuff on a pretty big level. This is in Santa Barbara in like the mid-2000s before Molly was really popularized in, um, in culture. And... <clears throat> I kind of became a de facto heroin dealer just because my habit was so bad. I was on the methadone program, so I started doing 11 grams of heroin a day because I could barely feel, um, I could barely feel heroin unless I did that much because I was already on the methadone. And because of my habit, I started picking up pounds down in East LA. And that went on for a couple of years. I was making really good money. I was making about 10 grand a week. And I got busted by the FBI and DEA in 2008, November, of 2008 
And I went to, I was indicted federally on two counts, conspiracy to distribute heroin and possession with intent to sell heroin. And I was looking at 10 to life. And we spent about 80 grand on an attorney. We got this guy, Robert Sanger, who's one of Michael Jackson's attorneys. My family helped. I still had money from being a drug dealer. And I got it down to five to 40 years. And in the feds, they do months. So I got sentenced to 60 months in prison. Um, and I served almost five of it, you know, about four and a half years because I lost a lot of good time. And in the feds, you do about 87% of your time. While I was in prison, I got sober my last year. I was doing heroin the whole time I was in prison, but, and up until the last year. And I ended up getting sober and I wrote my first novel, Wasting Talent. And it came out in 2014 and I stayed sober for three years. When it first came out, it did okay. You know, um, I got kind of a small cult following, um, nothing too major. And in that time I relapsed and that was in 2015 when I, so I got out in 2013, I was sober for my last year, stayed sober for two years. I was engaged. I had a fiance and I relapsed and lost everything within a week. I was living down here. I had a condo in Encino and she took that, she took the dog everything. I mean, I got stripped materially at that point. And ever since 2015, um, you know, it, I, I've been in and out. I went back to federal prison for three months for a nonviolent D or for a non-conviction DUI. So I got a DUI for having a 0.06 of alcohol. And I think it's a 0.08 is the legal limit, but because I was on federal probation, they sent me back to prison. Like real, I went to Lompoc penitentiary for three months, got out and um, I caught a pimping and pandering case. And honestly, I didn't do that, that one. It was kind of a sensationalized bullshit case. Um, and I tried to fight it, but I didn't have a lot of leverage because I was on federal probation. They let me bail out and they let me resolve the case on the state level before they implemented the violation. But I was going to prison no matter what. And that's what they were telling me. They're like, you're going to get a violation that's going to be two or three years anyway. Resolve it in the state. The best play was what my attorney was telling me is to get it run concurrent. A week after I caught the ca I caught the pimping case, I was out on bail. I got a film deal for Wasting Talent. And I optioned it to Will De Los Santos. Uh, he wrote Spun. Um, and Chris Hanley, who produced American Psycho, Buffalo 66, Bully, some of my favorite movies he Me jumped too. on as Great a movies, yeah, yeah. jumped on as a producer and, and Nick Stahl signed on to um, play Damien. Which Nick is Stahl was in term was he the Terminator? Terminator three. Yeah, great he was, actor. He was John Connor in Terminator. And he's your boy. Yeah. He's, he's your boy. So who better like to play you? One of great. my best friends. Got it. You know, he's a great actor. I loved him in Bully. Right. That's like my one of my favorite performances of all time. He was Bobby Kent Bully. It was, it was amazing. Oscar worthy in my opinion. Um, and so I'm out on bail just caught the pimping case. I meet my girlfriend that I'm with now and she gets pregnant almost immediately. So I'm out on bail. I have a baby on the way, just got a film deal. And I'm, I'm really good friends with Jim Oles. He wrote the screenplay for Fight Club, A-list writer. And he's kind of been a mentor to me. And Jim Oles, you know, we had talked about maybe the idea of doing a documentary about myself just because I was getting success. My book started kind of blowing up when I got the film deals because I got covered by like Huffington Post, Penthouse, several other newspapers and magazines. And because of the film stuff, it just kind of legitimized me more. So I started getting a lot more press attention. And Jim, I was considering doing a documentary with someone else and Jim said it was a good idea. And, you know, there was, there was definitely the concern that it could be exploitative about me. I have all sorts of archival footage of me shooting heroin, smoking crack, running around with guns, really insane archival footage. Um, but because I had a baby on the way, I was just down for it. And what were you down for it? Meaning that you wanted to just get it. I wanted to make it happen. Yeah. Right. To yeah. make money, to support the to, baby. To make, well, yeah, I, I didn't know the, it, there was an uncertainty with how much time I was going to do. Right. It's three year mandatory minimum for state for pimping and pandering. Right. What so, does pandering mean exactly? Pandering is like brokering prostitution. Okay, so it's, go, it's, it's under the, the pimping umbrella, in case you didn't know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, right. the illustrious pimping umbrella. Right. It's okay. under that. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm looking at three years mandatory minimum in the state for the pimping alone, 
Not to mention I'm on federal probation, so they can essentially double that time. So I'm looking at like maybe three or four years in prison. So state and federal, these are two different things happening at once, correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And All they right. can run it consecutive, which right. is called running it wild or bow-legged, where you have to go do the state time, and then as soon as you get out, you got to go do the fed time. time. Would you rather do federal? Is that easier than state? Uh, it's That's a complicated question. Okay. It depends on where you do your time. Right. I was unfortunate that the vast majority of time I've done in federal prison was in highly volatile, combative prisons right. where they were super violent, gnarly. But you're uh, a nonviolent offender. I'm a nonviolent offender, yeah. So, I, still- yeah, and I think that's one of the that's one of the very obvious flaws in the criminal justice system is that you mix mm-hmm. nonviolent offenders with violent offenders, and you're essentially cultivating violent offenders out of right. people that weren't yeah. before that you know right. and i got p i had ptsd from it. i saw people get stabbed i saw all sorts of crazy shit in prison and so around this time that i started getting more attention with the press i'm i don't know i started getting delusional maybe and thinking that i could manufacture fame and get big enough where i could beat the case if i had enough public support mm-hmm. behind me and i started talking to like immortal technique and he was going to come play um a charity event for the me. the rapper yeah cool the rapper yeah. immortal technique right. i started talking with him and then i had like a falling out with his with viper records the people you know it's like i made a lot of promises that i couldn't keep hey right. i'll give you the ten thousand dollar deposit on this date and i was so like amateurish i didn't know that like you had to use cash to pay the deposit or they have the rider with like their yeah. demands. We yeah. need 25 green M&Ms and six, you <laughs> right, know, it's right, like, right. so I was kind of like becoming new to that. And then I met Nick Stahl during that time and he became one of my best friends. So it was weird. Like all these people that I looked up to start being actually in, in my life. Yeah. I got delusional and I'm like, what's well, surreal? I mean, all of a sudden these people in your life, I could imagine why I knew you're sober at this point. Or- I'm well, um, I became a really bad alcoholic in 2016. Right. And I'd never had a problem with alcohol. I don't like alcohol. Yeah. But I got physically dependent to it. I was drinking yeah. like two fists a day. And the girl that I had the baby with, when I met her, she was in the throes of alcoholism. And, you know, we were both drinking two fists of whiskey a day. And we right. were squatting in abandoned houses. Like she lost her job. As soon as she met me, it just completely exasperated right. um, her pre existing alcoholism. We were like homeless. We were like dressing up in nice clothes and going to open houses with realtors and pretending like we were going to buy houses. And then I'd be like, hey, can I use the bathroom? And I'd go unlatch the bathroom door and we'd make sure that these were houses that were furnished, you know, like stage furniture houses wow. where there's not occupants and we're living in them. And Did there's you ever a, get caught? I never got caught. No, I mean, if I'd gotten caught for that out on bail yeah. for the pimping... Not already right. on federal probation. I don't even know what the charge is for that, but I probably would have been really fucked. You right. Know? Um, and during, you know, so when we found out that we were going to have a baby, she has, she hasn't had a drink since. And to be supportive of her, I just said, you know what? You're pregnant. Solidarity. There's going to be solidarity. I'm going to quit drinking too. So we both quit drinking. She stopped about a week or two before me, but I haven't had a drink since. I smoke Good herb. Yeah. I do sub- I, I take Suboxin, but like I don't do hard drugs anymore mm-hmm. and I don't drink. And that's because of, you know, the kid and I missed his birth. And so what ended up happening? Because you were in jail? Yeah, because okay. I was in jail. So I started, I like, you know, some kind of like celebrity figures wanted to throw a charity event for me or at least be involved with it. Danny Trejo is going to host it. And originally we we're going to have Immortal Technique do the music. And there's just going to be a bunch of people, famous writers, whatever, people that believed in prison reform. It's a very hot topic in yeah. the national yeah. dialogue right now. So I was about to have this event. I had like this huge billboard of me up in Santa Barbara and you know, the, the local newspaper did a pretty big story on me. We made all these flyers and I started getting like a lot of attention, started getting increasingly more delusional. And then knowing that I was going to back to prison, the impending doom of it made me have a manic episode where I wasn't sleeping, even though I wasn't on drugs. I didn't sleep for like eight or nine days. So I had like some of that cocaine psychosis yeah. or that psychosis that I'm used to having. And like at one point I thought my parole officer was trying to kill me and I called the FBI and I was like, hey, my parole officer's trying to kill me. I need you guys to come protect me. And like, I'm like the kind of person that just is very anti-authoritarian. I hate law mm-hmm. enforcement. I cannot believe that I got to the point where I was trying to ask them to like to protect me from this guy. Right. But I legitimately thought that as my message was growing and I was getting a following and a platform that these people are trying to take me out. Like I had these like grandiose delusions like that. 
And so... Um, what did the FBI say when you called and said my parole officer is trying to kill me? Well, I mean, to make matters worse, I recorded the call. Oh, and I, I, I mass released it <laughs> to everybody on my email list. Every ex-girlfriend I've ever had, every, you know, anyone I've ever had any contact on my email. And I also put it on my social media. So people are like, you know, like I have hardcore convict friends. And they're like, what the fuck? fuck are you doing man? right you calling the fbi and like honestly i was just in a state of complete psychosis and i couldn't discern between reality or not that's, you know? that's eight or nine days of sleep you will lose your shit yeah like that. i mean you, you yeah you, I, in it, like i was getting sponsored by like clothing companies and like this tattoo sleeve i have i got that done for free i'm getting like during this time during this time so i'm getting this like false sense of importance or like this inflated ego that i mm. never had and I try to weaponize it. I'm like, okay, if I can get big enough and get enough public behind me, I can probably beat this case. So I want to do that charity event for prison reform. I started a nonprofit called the Prodigy Foundation to expand literacy in prisons and help and mass incarceration. And I and I got I I knew that I was too unstable to be the poster child for it or to you know run it i didn't want to be the face of it so i assembled some of the top activists in the country to actually run it for me and i actually filed with the secretary of state and i i got it going and we were gonna launch the nonprofit with this event and around that time my parents broke into my condo because they thought that i was going to kill myself i mean they really 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 thought that i mean i I mean, I went, I, I, I literally went crazy. Let me give you one example about three days, three or four days. This was on Thanksgiving. When's Thanksgiving? The 22nd? 20, third week. Third third week, week. Third it's always different. Yeah, the last November. Thursday of every, third. I don't know. I'm not good with holidays. But anyway, end of, the, end, of, <laughs> so, end of November. So we go, we go up to uh, Santa Cruz. My family, it's my pregnant girlfriend, my mom and dad, and myself. And we go up there to spend Thanksgiving with my extended family, my cousins, my uncles, aunts. And I have not slept for like five or six days at this point. And I'm smoking blunts, trying just to like, you know, um, calm down a bit. I was just so, I was just so neurotic. What about think. taking like a, a anti-anxiety? You, you, like you a wouldn't Zana. take a Xanax? I was, I was taking benzos too. It I had wouldn't work. Nothing would work. Nothing was wow. working. I was just so... You needed a tranquilizer. I was, I was overly yeah. stimulated. And so we go up there. We leave at around uh, midnight. And I had a rental minivan at the time because we were filming the documentary and I was using it to like move equipment around. We were in production at that point. Um, and it was financed and like, you know, I was like the, one of the main producers on it. So I did a lot of hands on stuff for the doc myself. We're finished filming and we're in post production. Now it's coming out next May. But um, anyway, so that night we're in this minivan and my dad's like, I'm driving. And I say, no, I want to drive. He's like, you've been up for a week. You've been smoking blunts all night. I don't feel safe with you driving. And so I kind of threw a fit, but he ended up driving. He was driving bad on the freeway. You know, he's older, he's in his seventies and I started yelling at him. I'm like, I'm like, Hey, you're swerving, pull over, pull over. And he pulls over on the median on the freeway, like on the wrong side right. of the shoulder, you know, probably just because he's really concerned because I'm acting so, um, just unstable at the time. And so he pulls over on the median and then he ends up getting off and we're in Watsonville, California, which is like super ghetto part of Northern California. It's by Salinas, Norteño territory. It's like past midnight now. And I get in this huge, I have just a meltdown with my family. I'm just like, fuck you. You've never been supportive of my dreams. Like you don't believe in me. You always want me to get a nine to five job. I should be a creative person. Look at all this attention I'm getting, all this fame that's coming. Just really delusional shit. And I try to get my pregnant girlfriend to come with me at like 1230 in the morning in Watsonville. And she's like, I'm not coming with you. And I'm like, I'll never forgive you. You're betraying me. So I'm like, I'm leaving. Fuck you guys. I'm taking an Uber home. They're like, dude, that's going to be like $700. Like, what are you thinking? I'm like, I'm out of here. And at the time I was working on my second novel, June Gloom, which comes out next year too. I had it on my laptop. So there's no way I'm not leaving with my laptop. So I grabbed the laptop, but it still has the 
the winding cord coming out of it, you know? I'm wearing a wife beater. I just got this sleeve done. I've spiked hair. I have dress pants on and shoes. I look like a, a pecker would, you know? I don't look like a civilian. Uh-oh. I start going down the street and I get to this like shadowy street. There's no, it's, and it has all the symptoms of a bad area. It's projects, there's trailer mm. park right there. And I go down this dark street. Now there's like flickering lights on the street, but barely illuminating it. So it's very dark. I'm going and a group of like four or five Hispanic kids, maybe in like their early 20s, for sure, Northerners, they, they're Norteña. They, pull, they, they see me and I mean, I'm walking down the street with this laptop, the cords dangling out. I look like some crackhead that's clucking it, you right, know? Right. And they, they roll the window down and they're like, what's up, homie? And I'm like, fuck, there's no way I'm giving my novel up. You know, I don't care about the laptop, there's no way. Yeah. These guys are probably strapped. They probably have guns right. on them. So I had to make like a quick second decision. And I just look at them and I go, I'm with law enforcement, That's homie. Smart. Right? smart. And they look at me and they're laughing. And I start running towards their car. And I'm like, I'm like 1987 El Dorado for Hispanic males. I'm like yelling it into my shirt, looking like a total weirdo. And they're stopped. So it's clear that they don't believe, like, they're probably yeah. like, dude, is this guy for real? And then I'm sure one of them's like, what if he is for real? So they just peel off. So that's the smartest thing you could have done. And so I have the laptop. And I'm like, fuck yeah, I, don't, I still have my yeah. novel. I still have my novel. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah. And so I call my little cousin and I'm like, Nortenos are trying to kill me. You need to come get me. And she's like, what the fuck are Nortenos? And she's like, I swear, you know? <laughs> and, um, and so she's like, drop your pin, drop your pin. I'm like, you don't understand. They're going to come back like 30 deep and fucking slaughter me. And um, so she doesn't come get me. So I have to go <laughs> back to this liquor store parking lot where my parents are. And eventually, you know, my girl's like, honey, just sleep in the back seat." And that was like three or four days before I went to, or a week before I went to prison. I went December 1st. Did you finally sleep? That's, yeah, what, what was the break? What was the I, I slept a couple nights after that. It was still a couple nights. Like after that, I went on some trip where I thought my girlfriend was cheating on me. And, I was and like, she still stayed with you through all of this? With all of it. Solid. And your know. family's had, yeah. still had your back. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, they stuck with me through all of it. She's solid. She stayed with wow. me through my whole prison term that happened right after that. How long did you serve? 16 months this time. 16 months. I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, and so like the straw that broke the camel's back was... A few days later, the event's supposed to happen on Monday. The financiers that had, you know, funded the event initially thought I was on drugs. I mean, I'm emaciated at this point. Mm -hmm. I had lost like 15 pounds in the course of this psychosis, right? Neurosis, whatever it was. And so they think I'm on drugs. They pull out and they take their deposit out of this event. I'd already paid for the flyers. People, I'd already paid for people to fly from all over the country. And I'd put money into it, but without the deposit, I think it was like 7,500. And without that, we couldn't have the venue, you know, and Immortal Technique, that was long gone. Like he, I didn't pay their deposit. So uh, this guy at Viper Records is like, you know, I'm leaving these crazy scathing messages. Fuck you guys. Rah, you don't know who I am. And I'm like, you know, nobody. It just all fell apart. <laughs> you know, and it all fell apart. So the Friday before all this. Uh, before the event's supposed to happen. So now I know that it's like not happening and I'm posting stuff on Instagram. And I'm like, call this theater and tell them they're trying to suppress prison reform message. I'm like on some really radical shit, you know? And so people started calling them and harassing them. And like, so they were getting mad at me. And so the, the Friday before everybody had left, my, my friend whose condo I was staying at, he just took off. He couldn't deal with me. My girl had taken off because I'd like smashed her cell phone because I was convinced she was cheating on me. And so I'm alone. These, these two friends flew in from Michigan and they're like, let's go get an Airbnb in, in Malibu. Let's chill out. Let's go party in LA for the weekend. I'm like, okay, cool. I need to go get my Suboxone and Xanax from my condo. I go in there and they're not in my drawer. My parents had come in and taken them because they thought that, some, that I was going to kill myself with my medications because I was just so unstable. So I go up to their house and I'm begging for them back. I don't want to. And my, my first thought about it is that if I don't have my Suboxone, I'm going to relapse in LA. I'm not going to be sick. I'm going to go score. I'll just go to Six and San Pedro and I'll get some balloons. I mean, that's what's going to happen. And I wanted to avoid that. So I had good intentions behind it, begging them for it. They'll only give me one Suboxone. 
and that's just not going to cut it. You know, I'm taking like three or four of them a day. You know what point. Suboxone is, right? Adults. Suboxone is a, the lingual strip that you take that's basically for uh, heroin u- users so they don't you know, relapse. So he's talking about if he runs well, out, he's going to get and a balloon would be heroin. Methadone's a similar thing, but it's a more dated version. Oh. Suboxone's newer, right? Is that fair to say? That's fair to say, yeah. Right. Methadone yeah. was created in Nazi Germany, yeah. and it was created because, the, you know, the Nazis... Hitler was paranoid that the morphine supply was going to get cut off, and that was a good way to demobilize the, you know, the the, the opposition. And so right. he took the preemptive steps. He's like, let's create some synthetic opiate. They they made methadone, which is much stronger. It lasts for much longer, and then they started using it as like a maintenance drug in like the 70s problem with it is the withdrawals are nightmarish mm-hmm. i came off it my first fed worse than heroin oh yeah Lost like it. mental not physical mm-hmm. you both. lose it both. really physical i was dope sick for six months wow instead of a week how much were you taking were you 100, taking? 180 milligrams the liquid oh the know? liquid wow yeah. that's heavy yeah 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 i was at a clinic and everything so and then suboxin this is suboxin Okay. And I take them every day. There's little sublingual strips. It has buprenorphine in it, uh-huh. which stimulates the opiate receptors, and it has naloxone in it, which is an opiate antagonist. It's a mm-hmm. blocker. So when you t- when I take this, I know that if I'm in a bad mood, I can't go downtown LA. Yeah, it won't let me get high. Yeah, right. Okay. And I'm yeah. a dad. I'm not trying to have a bad mood kill me and make my kid grow up without a father. And you know, yeah. a lot of people give me shit about it. Oh, you're not, you're still a junkie. It's like no, I'm not. Right. I'm functioning right now. Like, yeah. Please, yeah. like, do you. you know, yeah. Stay in your own fucking lane. You know? Right. So, um, anyway, so I call 911 and I say, listen, I'm not trying to press charge on my parents, but I need my medication back. They're like, okay. So they come up and I, and I had a GoPro on me because I was so like paranoid thinking that they were going to do something to me. So I have this on footage. This is in the documentary. I go up to the cop and I'm like, thank God you're here. And they say, get on the ground, put your hands behind your back. They arrested me because my federal PO had issued a warrant because, you know, I'm like calling the FBI and like saying I want a restraining order because he would say stuff like you're making me feel like he'd come to drug test me and be like, you're making me feel uncomfortable. If I feel threatened, I'm going to fucking shoot you, you know, stuff like that. And I already have PTSD from prison. Mm -hmm. It's like I've used this metaphor before, like normal people kind of float on a raft down like the river of life. Right whatever happens you meander certain things happen you get stuck keep going but it's just a trajectory that keeps going it's the same thing when you have ptsd but it's like swimming in a murky ocean and you have no idea what danger lies beneath so instead of just coasting through life i'm constantly swimming and struggling and thinking that a shark can come just swoop me out at any minute because you see so much betrayal in prison and you see so much bad stuff happen you get these lingering and residual, uh, you know, paranoid sentiment where everything, everybody's out to get you. So in a lot of ways, I thought that they had created that monster themselves. And that was my whole thing. Like I was trying to rally against the prison industrial complex and be like, you're not helping me. You didn't Mm -hmm. rehabilitate me. You stigmatized me with a felony. I can't get work, you know, Mm. and there's absolutely no treatment done. And incidentally, after I caught the pimping case, I bailed out and I went to court order therapy that day. I'd never met my therapist, but I was court ordered because I just got out of prison two weeks before Lompoc, right? Just paroled from my little three month violation. She could tell that I was, something was bothering me. You know, I just gotten arrested the day before and she was like, what's wrong? I'm like, I'm not going to tell you. You'll just relay it to my PO. She goes, no, I'm sworn by confidentiality laws. I can't tell your PO anything unless you are a danger to yourself or somebody else. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, let me just get, let me, let me. Let me come clean with this. So I tell her, she's trying to process it because at the time I was really about trying to change. And she calls me an hour later and she goes, hey, I'm just an intern. And by the way, um, I checked with my boss and we have to notify your PO oh, by noon on. tomorrow that you caught a new case. Wait, the intern pretended they were the therapist? I don't understand how they she, could do she, that. Yeah, she never disclosed she was an intern. Right. Okay? Yeah. We have this on the documentary too. I have this phone call. Right. I don't even care if I get sued. I'm going to put her, this bitch on blast. Seriously, Wait, what did you t- what did you tell her that was they would use against you about your your PTSD? What was it that you said? No, to, I said oh. that I caught the pimping. Case. Oh, got it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I'm on probation, got and it. I had bailed and so out. You have to alert. And so right. she's like, "You need to tell him by noon tomorrow." I'm just like, "Are you serious?" I said, "Not only did you coerce me into doing that, mm-hmm. you have created long term. You, you've compromised my creative or my therapeutic integrity for life. Yeah. I'll never trust a." a fucking therapist right. again because of you right and mm-hmm. if you do this to me you're probably doing this to anyone so that's what the rehabilitation efforts are when you're when you're um you know when you're on probation or parole this completely um 
you know, th this, this form of therapy where it's essentially them doing reconnaissance missions and gaining intel on you. And that's exactly what's happening. Hey, did you fight with your girlfriend? Oh, yeah, I did. Then they took, right. I think he's at risk for domestic violence, you know, yeah. shit like and that. And yeah. it's like, man, that, and, it, you know, if I was, um, if I was oppositional towards authority before that, that certainly like solidified it right there. I'm just yeah. like, wow. And um, so they arrested me. I went to jail. I had to kick the box in cold turkey. How was that? It was horrible. I got beat up like my first week in jail because um, there was a bunch of heroin in there and I tried to buy it because I was kicking the box in. It was $1,200 worth. My pregnant girlfriend paid for it. As soon as they got the money, they jumped me. I got three broken ribs. It was a jack move. So you never even got your dope. I never got my dope. So now I had to kick cold turkey with three broken ribs Jesus. and they never once took me to the doctor so you had to sit in your cell with broken ribs yeah wow and is it super easy to get heroin in prison it's, yeah yeah it, yeah okay but then you work up a debt and then you're dealing with that whole bullshit yeah and yeah. and you know like there's a lot of these new um youtube celebrity prison people i'm seeing this pop up everywhere right now and they're on the hyper masculinity and the bravado and i have nothing against these guys i mean that's awesome that they i mean you get out of prison you have the blemish of a felony, it's very hard to get conventional work. So if you can get paid by talking about your experiences on YouTube, that's amazing, that's great. Yeah, right. Support 100%, but I've never presented myself as a tough guy. Like I went into prison the complete opposite. I was scared and I was a drug addict and I had no business being in there. I was constantly in debt, you know. I my manipulation and lying skills like went up tenfold while I was in there. Yeah, just to survive. Just to survive. Well, what, and you're, are you, uh, what is, what's your ethnic background? Um, I'm Italian. Okay, so you had to, did you have to click up with the with white the boys? Woods, yeah. Okay, with so the, then all of a sudden oh, you're in prison yeah, politics. That's a gang, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that, no, it's okay, yeah, this, you have, it's all by race in California. I mean, okay. I, I only know, because I watch these videos all the time and I've had a couple guests on, I've had friends that have done time and you gotta right. click up with your people, so then okay. all of a sudden you're in these prison politics with white people. You do, and, and it's not, you're not just, you're not just um, automatically accepted by your race either. You have to have clean paperwork, you can't be a sex offender, you can't be a snitch. And pimping and pandering Pimping is, and pandering is like, you know, well, it's a wobbler. Um, meaning it's a that wobbler. It, it's like right on the line. Okay. You know, okay, it's like they it, might accept you. Well, like they might. I, I, I for sure thought that there's no way the general population was going to like be okay with that, but they were okay with it when mm -hmm. I when I went in there. Um, and what I was told is that because the prison politics in California are, are, are super uh, extremist, you know, mm -hmm. very anti-sex offender, and that, I love that. But pimping. If, it, if it's not on a minor, you don't have to register. So it's not a sex crime. It's more of a commerce crime. Interesting. And they don't, the whites, you know, I mean, the, the Aryan Brotherhood essentially is the hierarchy of the whites. And they dictate right. the politics. And at some point, I guess they said that that's okay. That that one. But, you know, things are changing rapidly. Like right. the Southsiders now, if you have a domestic violence, oh, that's, you're no good. That's a no good. And that's new because domestics it's always changing are huh? easy to get yeah. i have a domestic i've never hit a woman in my life you, you a could, cop comes and you guys are fighting it's her word against yours you're gonna lose without evidence you lose and that's yeah. it yeah that's scary shit. Ever that could since, happen anyone ever since oj ever since yeah. that happened the domestic violence policies and the protocols have become way more stringent and it's favored women, which is okay. I mean, it, I hate guys that hit women. I'm like complete, like, I mean, I'm not like a big principal or moral guy, but that's one principle that I have. It's right. like, I would, yeah. I, I just, I, I just do not like, I have disdain towards men. You can hit on women, but don't hit women. Don't hit women. Now, I'm real quick, uh, where, you, you're very well spoken. You have a great education. You're a smart dude. I could tell you're really intelligent. Did you learn, did you learn in prison or were you already, did you get a college education, a high school? Where did you learn? Because uh, I, got, I could tell you, you have I, a high IQ. You're I'm not, I'm not very, uh, you know, I don't have like an orthodox education. Like I said, I grew up. Um, going to institutions for troubled adolescents and I got a high school diploma it was one of those things where like you fill out packets and then like the tests are proctored so I had to teach myself like a, like a GED no, well it's funny it was in Utah and I actually did take the GED but I don't have a GED it was a, those credits were applied to my diploma so right. it like helped me finish off the last six months of my my school well, you wrote you wrote almost two books now you you i could tell you read you just seem like a smart dude i, I so, do yeah, yeah. It's, it, but to answer your question yeah um prison made me way more literary yeah way smarter i got an education in there and also i didn't realize that before i went to prison i dumbed myself down quite a bit because i was hanging out with a lot of people that 
I don't know, uh, like if you brandish intelligence, you look like you're condescending yeah. or patronizing or something. Did you speak differently? Yeah. yeah. I, and that's one thing I talk about a lot in my writing, in my new book, is that when you, you know, I've had to wear a lot of different masks and I've, it's about adaptability and I've had to be chameleonic. Um, Even know. that word, that's a good word. That's a great it's rooted syllables. in the word chameleon. Many syllables. Just so you know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, Simon. Smith. Yeah, <laughs> I'm translating. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so, and that's one of the reasons, my, okay, so they say that education is the biggest combatant to recidivism. Recidivism is when you go back to prison. And it, they don't give you vocational training. They say they do, but they don't. I was begging for vocational training this last term. Oh, you don't have it. If you, you can only do that if you have like 15 years to go. I'm like, fuck, 15 years of vocational thing's not going to matter. You know, they yeah, get out, what are you going to do? Yeah. You know, they, they give you no vocational training. Like they have the GD, but it's like, couple times a year and it's kind of hard to get into it um so my whole thing is i'm like man these okay to write a good book rule of thumb is you have to read a lot of good books you know and i don't think there's a convict out there that knows how to read that hasn't read a thousand books you know because that's what you do in prison you read books especially on lockdowns and the whole um and these guys have crazy life experiences. So one of my things that I was trying to do with my uh, nonprofit organization was to nurture the talent and mine stories from these guys and teach them, if not writing, maybe other art, music. There's a lot of people that are into hip hop and you know, uh, rock, whatever, different music. And I think if we nurture artistic outlets, it will help people capitalize on their life experiences and it will definitely help curb recidivism because education, just based on empirical data is the number one combatant against recidivism. If th- these guys get out of prison, like I, my family has money. So every time I've gotten out, they, they help me, help me get an apartment here. We'll give you first and last month's rent, go get a job. Mm-hmm. Like, they help me out. Uh, here's some new clothes. Here's a cell phone, you know, all these things that are blessings, but 98% of people that parole from prison don't have that. And what? I think that that's bullshit. You right. know, it's like, yeah. what are you supposed to do? And what I, what I would suggest, you know, when they talk about sweeping prison reform is to have them do vocational trading, mandate it, stop paying people sl- um, slave wages in prison. They give these guys like three or four cents an hour for like, yeah, it's fucked up. give them real jobs, put it in a savings account, get them a car and a fucking apartment for when they get out so that they're not going to be forced into the cyclical entrapment of recidivism. Is this what you're fighting for in your prison reform? Is this what you're at, you're, you know, you're trying to do? Well, it was, but it got derailed right. when I went to prison. Right. What, the only thing I'm doing right now is the paperback version of my novel I donate all the proceeds to prison reform and what I do is I send people in prison a postcard and a book book that I wrote and I send them a postcard and say hey I turned my life around I did that because I found literature and I turned my crazy life experiences into a book now I have two film deals and I think that you can do it too and just stay tuned here's a PO box write me and if you have ideas, I'm happy to help. Mm-hmm. And I want to try to get some more of my writer friends to nurture some of these people and help them so that they can, because you can, anyone can learn how to write in prison if you have somebody guiding them and telling them how to do it. Yeah, And there's absolutely. none of that going on. So yeah. that's what I'm doing. That's the only effort I have right now. But I plan to bolster my platform with the documentary, with the film. With the so the documentary is separate from the film that you're talking about that Nick Stahl is playing, correct? That's the, that's that he's acting in that. So that wouldn't be the documentary. He's well, he's gonna um, he's he's signed on to play Damien, which is like a caricature of me, it's okay. loosely based on me. The documentary he's narrating. Oh, I see. And okay. that's about my life. Got it. Um, and then I started a YouTube channel to try to cultivate an organic following. It's working. I've been watching it, and you're active, which is really good on YouTube. One of the rules is my big YouTube friends like you got to post all the time, and I see that you're con- every time I go to YouTube, there's one of your videos, and I'll tell you, like part 13, 14, like you get caught up in the narrative, and it's a it's an interesting story. So I think you're doing really good with the YouTube, which is uh, I could learn from that because I don't post enough, but you're supposed to post yeah, all the time. Uh, yeah, it's been you it's got been a lot of really stories. cool. People give me donations, and like yeah. I'm able to kind of supplement my income right now just doing YouTube stuff. People give me donations, and you know I get kind of you know paltry 
amounts from YouTube because they barely what's, what's the word poultry like what does that mean like minimal not a lot. oh minimal? like not a lot poultry like chicken pa- Pult- no poultry, poultry. Okay. Okay. I like learning new words that's my word for the day uh, sometimes I say words and I don't even know no. what the definition is but then right. I'm right right it's just <laughs> yeah. from yeah. reading yeah. Into yeah. It. Yeah. like I said it and immediately I was like oh what's your favorite book some of your favorite books I love Last Exit to Brooklyn by Hubert Selby Jr. he also wrote Requiem for a Dream oh, which really? everyone knows yeah, everyone I want to write these down I need uh, a new book um, you, uh, you read Shantaram that's a good book I've, oh yeah about the guy in prison oh, in man. India he great, escapes from yeah, prison yeah, dude. amazing book great book What's the, um, thank you I yeah. need to read more too but what's the access to I mean is there a large library in prison I mean yeah, internet I mean, access they got, they got like Star Trek, the next generation yeah, novels right. with like 30, last pa- the Brooklyn? last 30 pages missing. You know, last no, they don't have a good library. Last Exit to Brooklyn. Got it. Okay. okay. Cool. Uh, my next book. Sick City by Tony O'Neill. Oh, Junkie. Yeah, get too. the phone back. <laughs> Junkie Love by Joe Clifford. You know, um, I like Jerry Stahl a lot. I like Irvine Welsh. I love Brett Easton Ellis. Um, Brett Easton Ellis is a good writer. You know, he has a good podcast. You should listen Don to. Winslow is really good. What I, was I, it? Junkie Love, and you would mention one other one. Six City. Six City by Tony O'Neill and Junkie Love by Joe Clifford. And these these are my friends, but they, I mean, yeah. some of my favorite. You know, right. I was fans before we were friends. Yeah, you know? like, that must be cool. I've gotten to make a couple of friends through podcast world and stuff. Like Chris Ryan wrote a book called Sex at Dawn, which is really interesting about human sexuality and hunter gatherers. And then I became friends with them, and now I still hang out with them. I'm like, yeah, I cool. can't believe I'm friends with this dude that I learned so much from. It's so surreal. I know it's cool yeah, and so, I've, been, I've been listening to your music for years so yeah, it's kind of like it's, I'm sorry you know, it's cool. yeah. yeah my music I do a, I don't know if you even know this I have an alter ego called Dirt Nasty where I rap who? Dirt Nasty Who's all the yeah. girls that who's like dirty? think you're cute ask me about it oh, I'm about like Dirt I don't nasty. Yeah. yeah it's better you don't know I'm who's, like I don't know who's Dirt Nasty yeah, it's, his it's, alter it's, ego <laughs> yeah. I'm no, like I don't know he likes Dirt Nasty so tell me okay real quick question I am a fan I've been listening to that yeah yeah it's for us wait what's your what's your favorite song oh I we were just listening to what Cocaine. What's that? Yeah, yeah, 1980. 1980. I like that. Yeah, I did a cocaine song, the but dicks, I hate cocaine. The dicks like Jesus. <laughs> my, yeah, my dick. My yeah. dick. It was me and Mickey Avalon. Mickey Avalon. Oh, and, Jesus. Uh, oh, it's Loco. very immature. <laughs> no, it's, it's Three Loco. That's me, Riff great. Raff, Andy Melnick. But anyway, enough I'm about so that. I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so is my mom. Uh, now, okay, so real quick, um, you're... You, you, there's so much to process here, dude. Your your life's so crazy. I, you know, I, I actually you remind me of a few of my friends who who live this pretty intense lifestyle, right? Where where obviously your choices have led to, uh, you know, you going to prison and and uh, and and it's almost like you attract certain energies because you have gone down this path. Even though when you get your shit together, it's almost like it finds you. Like trouble still seems to find you. Like even when you were doing good and you couldn't sleep for a few days and all this fucking shit happens. Like, is it ever going to be a point where you think you could just like be rid of all this or is this going to be your narrative forever? Like, that's why you're telling the story. I think I have a propensity towards chaos. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think I'm comfortable in normality. Right. Um, you know, I, my life looks different now. Like I hang out with like legendary people and like, that's my new chaos, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like seeing, like having the veil unlifted and like. You know, like going to Johnny Depp's house and like seeing this person that I idolized my whole life up close, and now we're friends. Like shit, like that is really cool. I would, tr- I want to get away from like hanging out on Skid Row and like that kind of chaos. And I hope that that isn't uh, continue to be part of my story. Yeah. But I don't think it's ever gonna really get tamed. You know, it's just I hope I can channel it in like different ways and hang out with interesting people well you're doing that i mean i feel yeah. like you're doing that I'm now I, yeah yeah right now but it's a daily but it's a daily thing right. i mean who knows what could happen tomorrow you for know? sure but that's with anything but i feel like that's what i'm saying is that your uh, your story is really i mean dude there's so much to, to process here obviously you just kind of gave us some cliff notes of just one chapter i mean can i just go left field on you real quick i remember in the beginning before we started rolling you were telling me and i don't want you to have to relive any ptsd crazy sh- crazy shit but what people want to hear is like the crazy prison stories like what's yeah. some shit that you've seen that you're just like dude i don't want to go back there like what's some fucked up shit that happens because i i'm fascinated as never being in prison like what i'll, I'll tell you the, like the two most violent things oh. i've seen in prison let's hear it okay number one right so i was in a unit one day wait what's a unit a unit's your housing sorry your housing no that's fine okay that's fine who would know this i'm the loser that's always in prison <laughs> it's not you know it's okay uh, a lot of people don't know about this stuff but your housing unit is where you live so i'm in this unit it's like three two in the afternoon or something and I'm watching TV with the skinhead his name is Popeye 
right? It's this little like five foot five stocky skinhead. We're sitting there, we're watching something on TV. Now each race has their own TV. You know, the blacks have their own TV, the whites have their own TV, oh. the Paisas, the Southsiders, and then there's usually the others, which is like miscellaneous races, and they usually don't have a TV. But yeah, Paisas are Mexicans that <laughs> yeah, are I was not. Ask. Yeah, Paisas <laughs> are the type of Mexican uh, immigrant that are more the cowboy kind of Paisas, yeah, yeah, right? Paisas like means like uh, you know like people of the country, right. so it's like. Oh, I people, thought it was like their star people sign. Mexican, Mexican. No, 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 yeah. no, but very close. No, it's like guys from like. The guys that wear, you know, the cowboy hats right. and the belt buckles oh, from yeah. T- the T- real, you know, yeah, real, real deal Pisces, you know, and I, I love Pisces, you know, my, my girl's Hispanic and her family's from Mexico and I have no, you know, I, I like that culture a lot. Yeah. Um, but everything's separated. And then in federal prison, you can't have TVs in your cell. In state prison, you can, you can buy a TV and you can watch it. But oh. in federal prison, they're up on these pillars and they're up in like TV areas, either TV mm-hmm. rooms or they're up on pillars and it's separated by race. So we're watching the white TV, me and this guy Popeye. And this other guy, this is at um, Victorville, which is in the Inland Empire, really hardcore prison. It's been nicknamed Victimville. You know, that's like the, what everyone calls it. Yeah. So it has like a really bad reputation. And so we're watching TV. And this other guy, it's a lot bigger, he's maybe like 6'4", white guy, comes up and changes the channel. Because you, you have to wear headphones and you tune it in to the radio station for that specific TV. So this TV is like 88.1, right. this one's like 103.5. Whatever you're watching, you tune into that okay. particular station, right? This guy, I mean, it's common courte- courtesy and jail etiquette to ask, mm-hmm. hey, are you guys watching this? A lot this? of respect code. And he just yeah. goes and changes it. Right. Uh-oh. Now, I'm not like a confrontational guy. I'm just like, eh, whatever, you know? But this five foot five little skinhead guy is like, hey, fuck that, what's up? He has a Napoleonic complex. Yeah, and they start fighting. And they just start, you know, fist fight. They're fighting, and this short skinhead guy just beats the shit out of this taller guy. Beats him up bad, like bloody to a pole. And I don't break it up, but I kind of am verbally being like, okay, come on, guys, like, yeah. you know, you don't want to get caught by the cops, go to the hole, whatever. So we go for our four o'clock standard count. Every day at four o'clock in federal prison, you have to go in your cell for like an hour and a half or so. To you make to sure you're still up. there. You have yeah. to stand up so that they know that you're not you're not a mannequin and that you're there. They do like a body count. We do that every day. We come off of that, and this guy Popeye beat this other guy up. Really, I forget what the taller guy's name was. Let's just call him the taller guy. So, Popeye's playing pinochle with a group of inmates, like in the day room. What's pinochle? Pinochle is a I card game. Okay, it's a card game. It's like a more advanced version <laughs> okay. of spades. Okay. Okay. It's, it's well, like prerequisite like it. yeah. if you're in prison. <laughs> okay. Like every convict oh. plays pinochle. That's the that's the convict game of choice. Okay. So he's playing pinochle, and this guy gets a coffee cup and fills it with baby oil, and goes and puts it in the microwave. Uh oh. Back in 2009, they had microwaves. They've taken them out probably for this reason right here. So he puts it in for who knows five ten minutes until it's boiling hot. Fuck. Uh uh-uh. uh. And he uses Alcohol. like a beanie to hold the cup, like this burning. He walks up to this guy that's playing, you know, to Popeye that's playing mm-hmm. Pinocchio. He has his back to him, taps him on the back because he's all beat up and he's embarrassed because he got beat up by the short guy. As soon as he turns around, he splashes this boiling mm-hmm. hot baby oil in his face, and I saw it. And it was like dangling out of his eye socket, like an (gasps) earring. There was like trails of like gooey flesh. Looked like he was crying with like, like a stringy flesh coming out. And like it turned red, like a sunburn, you know? So, and like at first, it's just like a bad cut. At first it doesn't bleed right away, but then it starts bubbling. And the Uh -uh. scream of this was absolutely nightmarish. It was like this scream that I can still hear at certain times you know like sometimes i'll wake up with like night terrors and i can hear it fuck and i saw this shit and it's like the kind of thing you'd see in like some sort of horror film or something and that was like the second most violent thing i've seen the most violent thing that i ever saw in prison is um so you can make alcohol in there right that's a common thing in prison with like mouthwash no Uh, you make it with fruit. fruit you ferment it if you get fruit and you add what's called a kicker, 
right? It's like another rotting piece of fruit. Uh -huh. That bacteria will go into the other fruit, and if and you add sugar to it, it yeah. ferments it like you would with wine. Now, people take it a step further, and they actually use what's called a stinger, which is like an electrical cord, and they'll put that in the bag, they'll plug it in, they'll like, you know, heat up the alcohol and like the perspiration that collects. And I could be wrong about this. This was never my thing, but they distill the alcohol and it goes into clear liquor. You know, like moonshine. Like moon, it is moonshine. Okay. Yeah, it's moonshine. They they make the wine into moonshine. It's called shine. It's called white lightning in there, and they sell these white lightning. Li yeah. They sell these little honey bears for twenty bucks, like something that a honey bear honey would come in yeah. for twenty bucks. Right. So it's a big hustle in there. A lot of guys make it's very hard to do. You have to do it covert, and so yeah. you, they're constantly looking, and it stinks. You know, the the smell permeates yeah, yeah. any area that you're making it in. So this guy's making alcohol. He was from Texas. This was at um, Victorville as well. And um, he got caught, right? So they sent him to the hole for like 14 days, you know, which is like being in jail in prison. It's yeah. not like in Shawshank that Redemption. solitary confinement? It, yeah, yeah. But sometimes you the shoe? So yeah, right. shoe, special housing unit. It's all the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Administrative segregation, ad, ad seg, seg yeah, yeah. whatever yeah. you want to call it. Um, it's an isolated part of the prison that you go for disciplinary reasons. Uh, sometimes people PC up and go there because they can't handle the, the prison Oh, yeah. Stuff, Protective right? custody. Got it. Or, thank you. Or, Acronym. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> or, um, uh, you know, disciplinary. Like, they'll put you in there for, like, I've been there. I was in and out of there always for disciplinary. Always for dirty drug tests and stuff like that. Alcohol, a yeah. couple fist fights, whatever. So this guy goes to the hole, and the lieutenant comes up to him. And, oh, by the way, every prison is run by, like, a shot caller for your race. There's a shot caller. It's like the oh, president. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Each Got race it. has, like, a Trump. Mm -hmm. And they, like, get together, and it's, like, diplomacy, and they're like, okay. Right. Stop selling drugs to the blacks. Or, you know, yeah, and yeah. they, like, you know, they politic, whatever. And the climate of the prison is contingent on who's running it at the time. Sometimes you'll have really nice guys that don't, you know, their whole attitude is like, well, I hope it doesn't come to that. Yeah. Then there's some people that rule with an iron fist. And at this particular moment, they're, and usually these guys are strung out on heroin too. You know, most people in, in prison are strung out on heroin, even the guys that are running, running the prisons. So this guy was running it at the time and he was like this hardcore dope fiend. So this kid from Texas is about to get out of the hole. Lieutenant goes up to him and he says, hey, are you good to go back to the yard? You know, we're going to release you. They always ask if you're good to go back. Like, do you have money out there? You got enemies? Can we put you back in general population? This kid says, he's like, fuck that yard. It's run by a bunch of dope fiends and bitches. And somebody heard him say it. That's the worst thing you could call somebody. You can't prison. call somebody a bitch, a punk, or a lame in prison. That's automatic. We're fighting. Oh, worse. I mean, I've been to prisons where it's hands off policy. It means like no fighting. You stab somebody if somebody yeah. says that. So people got message back to the yard that he said that because the lieutenant said, I don't care. You're going back anyway. The way that you get message out to the yard if you're in the hole is they give you your meals through a meal slot. You get three mm -hmm. meals a day through a meal slot and it's two trays. So you stack it up and you put it back through the meal slot. And these guys will put kites, which is like a little message that's written in their tray and then it'll make its way back to the kitchen and the guys that wash the dishes know that it's coming it, yeah. from the hole mm. and to look out for messages and it'll be addressed where it needs to go and it's usually written in very small writing yeah. it's like a talent in itself to write these things i could never do that and it's like in a scroll and then they like get like a little piece of a bag and like you know it's a scroll like it's wound up very tight and they put it in plastic so that you can keister it so you can put it up your asshole mm. Oh. and smuggle it around because it's a you can't have like orders like sometimes there's like hit orders on there like kill this guy or whatever yeah somebody had wrote in the kite that this guy had called everybody dope fiends and bitches so this guy gets out on like a wednesday and usually when they're gonna it's called a removal or they'll smash somebody off the yard or they'll whack somebody right they'll stab you or get a little hit squad and they'll go mm -hmm. stomp you out with boots. I had to do that to people just because I was a pecker wood and like I had to prove my yeah, solidarity prove. or whatever. And like, it's not like anything you walk away from feeling good. It's usually over stupid stuff. Mm. Like with the one that I was on was because somebody used someone else's beard trimmers to shave their balls. 
you know, which should be like a one-on-one issue. And I found that in prison, it's very, um, it's very favorite slanted, it's favoritism. This guy can do something because he's popular and he's in the in crowd in prison, but this other guy shaves his balls and now you have four 23 year olds stomping him out with boots on. And it's just very arbitrary and unfair. Right. So this guy gets out of the hole and we knew for like a week that this was going to go down. Like we heard he was going to get hit because the guy running the oh. yard at the time was like bloodthirsty. And the whites would have mandatory yard on Saturday. So if you're white, you have to go to yard. The reason being is people get in debts. People are fucking up Saturday. You show face. If you're fucking up, you get dealt with right then. And it's to like, keep everybody kind of in line, you yeah. know, stop running up debts with other races. Yep. The whole place is going to go up in flames because of you. And like, I was responsible for a lot of tension, a lot. Somehow I made it out of that prison on good terms. I don't know how, probably just cause I had family bailing me out, which I'm like not proud of, but I didn't go to prison for being a good person. You know, yeah. I'm just developing into a better person now, you know, and like I'm self-aware at least. But so anyway, we knew this hit was going to go down. Saturday night comes. I heard that this one kid was going to be on the squad. They didn't ask me once you kind of put work in, that's kind of it. Like you raise your hand once, you don't have to do it again. Really. Yeah. So it's like, a, and people are eager to do it to prove that they're like solid, you know? And so like everybody knew this was going to happen. Saturday night comes. And this kid is like inside like this kind of like quasi gym area. It has like a couple Stairmasters, stuff like that. And so he comes out and he has a duffel bag on with like all of his like gym stuff. He's wearing all gray, gray sweatpants, gray shirt. And I'm kind of, I remember I was smoking a joint that night on the yard. We were smoking a joint, a couple, me and a couple friends. And we knew it was going to happen, so we're watching. I mean, really, the whole yard's kind of swiveled and looking at him, you know? And we just see somebody run up and hit him, punch him in the face. And then, like, three or four kids, which is par for the course, they jump on him and start stomping him out with boots on. And, you know, he's in, like, a bloody pole. Now, this other kid takes a knife out and he starts booking him. You know, he starts stabbing him, probably stabbed him 16, 17 times. Now, these knives aren't serrated. They're not the kind of thing that kill you. Usually, it's usually superficial wounds, but you do bleed a lot from them. Um, only seen someone stabbed to death once in prison. Um, that was over a $17 debt. It was, a, it was a crip versus a crip. It was like a kid. It was like a 19-year-old kid got killed over a poker debt. It's the only time I saw that. But So this kid starts stabbing this white guy that was making the moonshine and called everyone uh, bitches and, and dope fiends. And so you already see this guy get jumped. You already see him get smashed. And then the guy that was running the yard walks out almost like <laughs> the dark emperor. You know, he kind of just walks out afterwards. This guy had probably like hair a little bit longer than mine. And he, he so everybody's like circled around watching mm. this because that's, I don't like watching violence, but a lot of people do. It's the kind of guy, if like I'm at a bar and a fight breaks out, I don't even want to be around it. It's just not right, my thing, right. you know? I, it's no, I, I just don't like that. So he goes up to this guy and he grabs his hair and he pulls a straight razor blade that's about, I don't know quarter the size of a credit card or something, but like a sturdy one, you know, it's like, it has thickness to it. He grabs him by the hair and he's, he's look, he's like, everybody take a good look. He's like, this is what happens when you call all of us a bunch of bitches and dope fiends. And he just starts slicing this guy's face and he does it 30 times, you know, it like ruins his face, disfigures him for life over just words. Wow. And Fuck. just, just like I said, with the boiling hot baby oil, it like took a good minute for it to start bleeding because they were so deep. But once it started bleeding, it was like a faucet. It was like a cascade of blood just, you know, coming down this guy's face. That running. was worth this that was worse than seeing the crip get killed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And this guy didn't he die. lived. He lived. He lived, yeah. Wow. But oh. he's marked for life. He got stabbed sixteen times. He probably got sliced up thirty times. Now how does that play in the outside world? Now when you go on the outside and these these things spill into your life, like if you hear that word, is that a trigger for you? Like obviously Bitch. any word that these things It was. Right. When I first got out after the five year term, I was kind of unhinged, you know. Institutionalized. Yeah. And um that word still had that emotive power behind it yeah i would hear 
you know, and girlfriends know that, you know, when you're dating somebody, they know what pisses you off. Right. Yeah. You know, you find out what someone else's insecurities are. And when you're really mad, you say it. Right. Right. And so I've had girlfriends be like, you're a punk ass bitch. Oh. And I'm just like, uh -oh. ah. <laughs> you know, what, you know? Um, but quite honestly, I'm like to the point now or now. It doesn't really matter. But with that being said, I haven't had a guy do it to me. Right. And I think if I was in a... See, like I said, I wasn't tough before I went to prison. It hardened me. Mm -hmm. It hardened me. Like, I used to be scared to fight. And I just kind of went in there soft, you know? But unfortunately, it's hardened me. And it's calloused me. And I'm, like, not scared anymore. And that's not necessarily a good thing. You know, that caution and that innocence has gone away. And I really don't take shit from people now, you know, and like uh, because men in prison are so bad at dealing with emotions, violence seems right, to be right, the right. most. And I think a lot of it's fear based. I think that popular culture conveys this certain idea of what prison is. So when people are in prison, they play the part and that goes with being yeah. chameleonic. So a lot of it is preemptive. Like you think someone's going to you think. I heard this guy's going to stab me. I'm going to stab him first. Or the whites always seem to be the most violent. And I think that that's a collective racial insecurity because whites I was say, really? are generally looked at as like not as tough or hardcore as like the blacks or Hispanics. So to compensate for it, they, they and the get, numbers are lower too. So they got to be the, that's, the that's numbers. What, uh, the numbers are lower and we essentially right. ally up with the South side. Right. But, like, prison culture in general is just so phony. I hate prison culture. Yeah, it seems... I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want to be a good convict or, like, it's... I don't want that to be my life. Right. But, it's so weird how quick we adapt, isn't it, as a species? You ever... Do you, did you adapt pretty quick to that prison lifestyle once you got off the dope and you were kind of <sighs> clear? I mean, what... I just know for me, I mean, obviously, it's not prison. I went to juvenile hall for weekends and that scared the shit out of me in Oakland. I was like, I'm good with this. Uh, <laughs> Jesus, Oakland, I'm yeah, sure, it is was just cracking, too. It was heavy. But I was just like, yeah, th I'll do whatever I can to stay out of this world because I just saw, like, a taste of it. I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. Uh, and I'm not a tough guy either. And But I've seen my friends go in and I see what happens. And I also... I've, I've moved to places before where I'll move to Shreveport, Louisiana for a few months and I'm uh, two weeks in, I'm used to it. Like you, we adapt quick. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you adapt, but like I said, it's like a contrived adaptability. You're trying to play a certain part. Yeah. That your persona you've, changes. You've watched in movies for right. years and it's just kind of, it's kind of bullshit. But then there's like some preconceived notions about prison that are false. Like, uh, I'll just answer the question that I know you're thinking. Yeah. I never fucked any guys in prison, but there's this weird homosexual connotation with prison. Yeah. It's, not, it's very strange. Like I've gotten out of prison and like, I'll just try to like have anal sex with a girlfriend or something. Yeah. Like, what are you some queer because right. of prison? And I'm like, what the fuck? Like right. if I didn't go to prison, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say that. that. No. Yeah. I've and heard the same thing. My buddies went to jail for years. He's like, that doesn't, it's not what it's you not. Think. What you don't you have like a bitch or no, like you are the no, bitch. And that, that not... changed. Like it was like that. One, you were asking about good writers. One of my favorite writers is a guy named Edward Bunker. He was in Reservoir Dogs. Quentin Tarantino really liked this guy. He wrote uh, No Be So Fierce, Animal Factory, which yeah. Steve uh, Buscemi directed mm -hmm. to a film adaptation. Uh, Mark Boone Jr. played in it. He's, he's a good friend of mine. He's on Sensei Anarchy. Mm -hmm. um, and Edward Bunker would talk about what prison was like in like the 70s and 80s. And I've also read other books, like in the Hot House, which is about Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary. It used to be like that. You'd have punks. Like, you'd literally have, like, mm -hmm. a sex slave right. that would, yeah. like, do your laundry and cook, and you'd, like, fuck them. Yeah. But by the time I got to prison, that wasn't going on at all. In right. fact, the politics were completely, um, you know, completely outlawed that. If you're white or if you're a Southsider, like, you cannot engage in homosexual activity. That's part of the, um, that's part of the politics. Oh. But you would think with popular culture and the way that they portray it that this is going on, that there's like... Is that a California thing, you think, too? Is, I wonder if another... I've states. heard... I've heard in, see, be, being in federal prison, you're kind of blended with people from all over the country. So mm -hmm. I've heard that rape happens in Texas a lot right. specifically. And oh. I've heard that it does happen. And they have, uh, what, Prima, they have prison rape laws so obviously the stuff's happening somewhere right but in my Just experience not. i didn't see it right i saw transgender people in prison mm -hmm. and uh um, aren't they housed separately not though? in the feds no right. they'll just mix you oh. there's no pc in the feds right so it's just everybody's kind of thrown together in general population so 
yeah, I mean, I'd see transgenders and the blacks and Pisces don't have law, uh, you know, they don't have politics that mm -hmm. prohibit you from engaging in that. So you'd see like a black guy holding hands with a transgendered inmate and like walking laps and like putting his jacket around her like stuff like that. And Courting they, them like it was, they'd use Kool-Aid yeah. as makeup. Yeah. Oh. And yeah. Uh, they sell bras for transgenders. They continue the estrogen. But um, as far as like homosexual activity, I didn't see that. I didn't see rape. I never saw that. Didn't yeah. even hear about it. What would you tell somebody listening to this that that might be uh, on the wrong path, who who might be going to jail sometime soon or doing the wrong drugs? Because I don't like to put drugs in the same umbrella. I think there's yeah, some drugs are good for you. I think doing mushrooms once in a while is okay as long as I agree. you don't get in trouble. I, I, think it's I, was, a good I was supposed to do ayahuasca last weekend. What are you talking about? I want to do it. I've never done it. Have you done it yet? No. No, no, no. I want to try I can, it. I can make that happen. I, gotta, gotta, I, gotta, <laughs> I want to go down and do it in South America, not to be a, an elitist, purist type person, but I do want to go experience it where I it's from. I have no desire. Shocking. No, it's, yeah, she's not into this kind of shit. She's never <laughs> done any psychedelics. She likes to, she's a lady of leisure who likes to have a cigarette and a glass of wine me on the other hand i like to do high vibration drugs that alter my reality and make me uh reevaluate shit like mushrooms lsd uh, ayahuasca i want to try um i'm trying we're to, cut I'm, from the same cloth on yeah, that time, and I, i'll never stop doing psychedelics i think never, they're good ever. for you i'll I think, never stop i think they're good for you um they're very, want, you know, you're i'm, I'm fine with it i you, just you get insights from it oh for yeah sure. you and get downloads and peel the onion back ayahuasca um i mean we can talk about that like yeah when we're, you yeah know, let's talk about your experience when i have you back on because we got there's so much more to talk about we can't get it all in an hour uh also real quick i'm trying combo you're familiar with this it's no. the okay well there's 5meo which is the toad oh, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. the sonoran yeah, bufo no, yeah, yeah. The combo it's is DMT a, it, in it? yeah it's dmt yeah. but it's a different form there's mm -hmm. an oxygen molecule which makes it different than regular dmt so mm -hmm. it has a uh, ayahuasca effect in the end you just have what a lasts. complete you have a death birth experience yeah. it's short it's only 15 minutes but supposedly it's very similar to ayahuasca but have you done the, dmt yeah i love it it's incredible it's uh it'll fucking <laughs> shift your whole shit I'm but like, and then the what? <laughs> well then there's the combo which i'm going to try next week which i'll talk to you guys about after because but there's it's not it's a, a psychedelic frog. it's a frog from the amazon which you burn into your skin but it's the ultimate purge and you don't get high but what happens is it goes into parts of your body and detoxes you on a cellular level stronger than anything you could possibly do on the planet earth but it's a frog from the amazon and it's used for thousands of years in medicine down there for healing people but now you know the white western man has found it and you go up and you have a ceremony like anything else and you burn it into your skin and you do three ceremonies within a week so every other day and you just purge so you throw up wow. you might shit your pants you cry whatever happens Jesus. and it goes into your <laughs> stomach and cleans your gut microbiome and it cleans your lungs and it's like the most powerful uh, detoxifier on the planet you might be interested in it i'll send you some info yes. on it <laughs> no I'm, yeah absolutely for real it I, seems I was, like something I, was you'd be I was supposed to do ayahuasca like last weekend right wasn't meant to be then and the people are like well you're on suboxone you can't do it yeah. you know like Wait, so how are you, you gonna get off suboxone to do ayahuasca i'm gonna have to get off it because i want to do it so bad because i've heard what about ibogaine a, that's I, good for detoxing I, I have not done ibogaine one of my best friends did it mickey did it said it was Salacious. Yeah, so he was gnarly. Like, said he yeah. quit smoking cigarettes. Yeah, oh. eighty percent uh, detox of anything you go in with an intent to clear out of your life. Um, yeah, it, it can do that shit. That shit's incredible. and it gets you yeah. well if you're dope sick. Yeah, and the throws of withdrawal get you well. So yeah, I'm that's supposed to do the ayahuasca October twenty. Where are you doing it? Um, I'm doing it here in LA. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, it's getting. There's an interesting topic that's going around, which is a lot of people are serving, and I'm not doubting who you're doing it with, or I, and I'm sure you know what you're doing. But there's a lot of people who are running around now who are serving plant medicine as if they're a shaman, and it's getting to be a little bit scary because you got to understand this is the most powerful medicine on the planet, and you got people running around that I'm hearing about because I have friends who are that are real pseudo shaman. shamans, and right? They're like, they're like, look, drink this, and you're like, yeah. you just took four times what you're supposed to and this yeah. is like they're playing the most magic. intense yeah it's not okay this is a portal to another dimension you can Dude. get insights you, you you do this stuff enough you're you, it's an inevitability that you're gonna bump into the divine it's just oh it's, yeah it's a mathematical certainty these are uh th this helps demystify the human apparatus yeah these drugs i mean and it's not a silly thing it's not something you no, take it's not a party it, it's something I don't think it's, it's silly. something no i'm not saying you do it's just you know people 
tend to discount what the effects can be from stuff like this because it's a drug. Right. And whenever you say yeah. drug, right, they think you're... It scares sm- people. No, and it's scary yeah. stuff because you got to be ready for it. And I think this sounds very woo-woo, but I think stuff like that <laughs> calls you when it's time. It's like, you know, I, it maybe it wasn't meant... It sounds it. crazy, but like wasn't meant for you to do it yet then. When it's time, it's time. You'll the do universe, that shit. The universal tell For real, that's some real say, shit. And this is when you're ready to do it. Yeah, and I'm glad I didn't do it then yeah. because I wasn't ready. And that could have been hellacious yeah. and not the right time. I need to be a little more spiritually developed yeah. before I can do it. And spirituality is something I'm just starting to have open-mindedness towards developing. Are I'm you, not there but yet. That's what a, a, but that's good. Yeah. You know, it's I'm not. Th- I'm not there. What about this? Have you heard of a Vipassana retreats? I'm always on yes. some woo-woo craze that she makes fun of me about, but it's okay. It's I like doing weird shit. I'm always trying mm-hmm. weird shit. And I'm going to try I'm the... I'm supportive Vip- of your weird No, no, shit. I like that you make fun of me about it. I'm going to try a Vipassana <laughs> retreat where you go... Uh, uh, there's a three day, a five day, and a ten day, or something like Isn't that. It, 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 they have a third. 30 day no oh uh, maybe i'm not ready for that shit you yeah. basically go and it's a silent retreat and you meditate all day and you don't get to say a word my buddy just went this is funny real quick and then we got to wrap it up pretty soon my buddy just went to a 10 day retreat and he didn't realize you know he's indian from india so uh, his family's <laughs> indian so he thought oh i got this in me i can do this so he goes to a 10 day <laughs> retreat and he had been partying for years and he thought he could just go cold turkey and just go be silent for days he lasted three days and had a full meltdown emotionally, mentally, breakdown. And he's like, I couldn't take it, dude. I'm out of there. And, and it was because he was detoxing nicotine, alcohol, whatever other substance he has. But I'm like, you really think you could just sure. go in and just cold turkey and go and not say shit for it? Like, dude, that is no joke. So when I go, I am obviously want to... I'm pretty sober right now. Like, I'm not sober, but I've never done less things in my body in my life. So I'm about ready to go try the Vipassana retreat. I feel like you'd thrive and something like that yeah. like we yeah, all need I'm, that I'm shit right yeah. would you ever do that yes yeah. absolutely right. i'm down for pretty much anything yeah yeah i get that i want to say i want to say i'm down I, yeah anyway. no i got yeah. you i got you <laughs> well dude all right so look we're gonna have you back on for another one because there's just too much to like, talk about with you so let's wrap this one up uh we'll do part two another time thanks thanks and we wish you continued uh uh prosperity in your staying out of trouble path because you seem to be doing good and we're rooting for you dude so i thank, appreciate you yeah, thank yeah. you so much I yeah, thanks for both you. It was, yeah. it was, I had a good time. Yeah, no, fun. you're a great yeah. storyteller, dude. Let's do it, let's do it, it again. Yeah, it's we'll very do it again. captivating. Oh, I man. learned a lot. Cool. Yeah, you're a great storyteller. So cool. we'll do uh, part two soon, all right, brother? Okay. Thanks for coming in. Cool. Oh, wait, real quick. Where can people find uh, you to check out, maybe to donate for your YouTube and all that shit? Yeah. Uh, my YouTube channel is just Ryan Leone. It's spelled R Y A N L E O N E. My Instagram's Ryan Leone85. Same with Twitter, although I don't really use Twitter as much. Okay. And uh, my book, Wasting Talents, on Amazon. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you, bro. Appreciate you. <laughs> Thank, right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Hey, guys. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Ryan. You know, that dude's got a gnarly story, man. That's some heavy shit. I, I, there's so much more to hear from that dude because uh, I felt like we just scratched the regalia. I'm coming to you from Bali, Indonesia right now, walking around being crispy. Just fuck. Oh, look at my guy. There's a little white bird. Like a sp- I wish I could show you guys what I'm looking at. I'm looking at a white, uh, like a Rangoon de la, de la Hoya bird. And he's on this beautiful temple, and he's just picking around like a little skooky. Uh, oh, yeah, and there's all these beautiful things overhanging on the street. Bali's a rad place, guys. You can hear all the scooters going by. It's, it's fucking it's fucking pretty De La Hoya, dude. This place is fucking Vespucci Ranglini. Uh, you can hear the chaos. It's like you ride a scooter around here, and it's just fucking madness. Ch- children and dogs with no helmet on hanging off scooters. Well, the kids... Obviously, dogs might wear a helmet, but you get what I'm saying. Beautiful people walking by. It's it's pretty crispy. Um, anyway, I'll be checking in. I'll be out here in Asia bouncing around. So these next few episodes I'm going to have on the outro, uh, just me checking in with you guys from different parts of Asia. I don't, I don't know. I just got a one-way ticket to Bali, and then 30 days later, a one-way ticket out of Bangkok into fucking back to LA, so no idea what's gonna happen. That's how you gotta travel, baby, baby. Just cruise around and see what happens. Uh, Yeah, me and Mickey Avalon got a show out here December 7th, that's coming up. So if anyone out there listening is in the Bali, Indonesia area, come check us out at Backyard. It's gonna be fucking Jespucci and Tanini, dude. It's gonna be fucking Hacienda Marcucci. Sorry, I just had a bulletproof coffee. All right, you guys suck your own dick. Love you. Here's a random dirt nasty song. Sick all these.
bullshit rappers acting like they're gangsters fuck and you, shit. Home. Like I give a fuck, bitch. I could act gangster too, homes. I that. can get fucking crazy. Get him, bro. I roll up in a Pontiac Riviera. Last 18 shots at your little sister. Uh. Crazy cracker in the head, roll through Compton, wearing blue and red. Stop, Who the fuck said dirt that you can't get gangster? I robbed the bank, thank you. Take all the duckets. Hey, legacy. What up, dirt? Jump in the bucket. Show anything that moves. Yeah. If the cops roll up, blast them dough. Even if a grandma crossed the street, clip that bitch and smell the meat. Murder, murder, murder. Kill, kill, kill. Blue, blue, blue. Bird nasty's here. Murder, murder, murder. Kill, kill, kill. Blue, blue, blue. Break us down. Yo, fuck it. Let's do a drop by naked. Somewhere in Oakland. Or Jamaica I said, I I'ma it. hang my dick out the back of the 62 Buick Cadillac uh, Crazy in the cabeza They used to call me Santino Gordeva oh, Cause nah. I'm a Cuban night stalker Hey Holmes, I'll be at the Ramada yeah. Smoking coke in 114 with a 14 year old dope fiend But the coke was clean Should've seen the blood that soaked my jeans Murder, 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 kill, kill, kill As the knife enters your body, uh. your soul left out your asshole. Gnarly. Dude, it's crazy the ants are already nibbling at your dick, baby. Homes, get on your knees and give up them rosary beans. I'ma burn them up. Yeah. Hey, where's Jesus now, chump? I'm a straight assassin. Kill Versace and blame Kunanin. Uh -huh. That little fag took the rap and they blasted his ass somewhere on a yacht. Mada, 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 kill, kill, kill. Blue, blue, blue. The nasty's here. Mada, 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 kill, kill, kill. Blue, blue, blue. Break it down. Mada, 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 kill, kill, kill. Kill, 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 blah, 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 the nasty's here, mother, 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 kill, 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 blah, 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 break it down.